Glad you're here, and uh, just, I mean, I truly mean in my heart because I, you all have blessed me in so many ways, not the blessing that the world might even recognize, but I appreciate the friendship, I appreciate the encouragement, but, but just your hunger for God, your desire to not just stay the same, um, you not trying to justify either yourself or anything else, um, but uh, struggling with me, with us, even with what we looked at Sunday morning the idea of Paul, not that I yet have arrived at this perfected nature or to that perfectedness, but I'm going to forget what's in the past to strain on, right? Uh, to live it out for all that he took hold of me for. And uh, I need others that will do that with me because it's not about us patting each other on the back and saying, I'm okay, you're okay, any more than it is about us condemning each other. It's about recognizing, but it's about knowing that you're with those that want to improve with their walk, but knowing that we've all tried in the flesh, we've tried with willpower, we've tried with self-control, but man, uh, there's nothing like turning it over to God and letting His Spirit then begin to work in us. And that's when then victory starts happening, but it's also believing as this, this series, what we're wanting to end up doing with it is uh, recognizing as we belong to each other, that's why. I need you and you need me, and it's not just the Barney song or whatever that is, you know. It's, it's so much more than that. It truly is. It's what God's designed, and when we believe that, man, we don't take each other for granted any longer. We don't look at each other the same way. We're not about nitpicking or finding fault any more than we are overlooking sin. Suddenly, we have a deep concern for each other because, man, we work together in that regard, and it's no different than a body that. Uh, fit. It's not just muscles and everything that work together, but I mean fit, meaning sound and good and healthy. When a body is healthy, man, everything works together. The uh, red uh, blood corpuscles and the white corpuscles and all work together. The uh, enzymes work in balance with the other things. You don't have too much of this or too little of that. An infection just doesn't have a way to, it can come in, but it doesn't last long because it's attacked. And that's what we need to be with sin in our lives. And it's not that, again, we go looking for it. It's just going to be, it's already within us. But what we're looking to do is get it out of us. And one of the greatest ways to do it is by participating in worship like we just did. I don't know about you, but I just don't really get tempted when I'm doing that other than pretending I can sing better than I can. That's the closest thing to temptation I got when I'm worshiping is let's let it all hang out. Who cares? You know, he said, make a joyful what? Noise, Noise unto the Lord. All right. Hey, it's not the chicken this time. It's uh, all right. So, anyway, wait, glad you're here. Uh, last week we looked at this picture of our body and being the temple. We're not our own. We were bought with a price. And the sum end result of it was, therefore, honor God with your body. We belong to Him. And so tonight, what I want to do is look at some of the teachings of Christ and also Paul. And what they say about this belonging to Christ, that we can have in our minds what, from heaven's angle, what it looks like, and that we can begin to get in our minds in from the earthly angle that uh, maybe the, the, sometimes it's just the awareness and go, okay, man, I buy into that. That's the way it is. Other times it's like, you'll have to do the same thing you've tried when you quit sinning is, I'm going to just try real hard to have this self-control and be able to say, and you come back to, okay, God, I've got to do this with you. And that's the way it is with belonging with him. So let's pray and then we'll dig in. God and Father, I truly thank you for putting your love in my heart, a love that uh, doesn't look at people the same. And God, thank you for not allowing me to uh, ever get into being religious, um, let alone that pharisaical religiousness that believes that everybody else is wrong and we're the only ones right. And God, within that, we don't want to be anything but balanced in your eyes and your sight. Uh, we don't want to be taking you for granted any more than each other. We don't want to be, uh, you know, lifting ourselves up as, wow, look at us and how good we are anymore than we want to be putting you down by putting ourselves down. And so, Christ, it's in you that we seek and we thank you for the promises the Word gives us that you are our righteousness, you are, you are our peace. It's through you that we have any holiness. It's your Spirit that will go ahead and bring good from, uh, from within and bring it to the out of us. It's that you that will help us to, Lord, as we surrender. And all you ask is we partner with you. And in doing that, we partner with each other. Thank you for your unbelievable design and desire to have a church. Um, not just a building, God, but no, a, a people that are built together. Uh, leaning upon and supporting each other just like two befores and nails do in homes and buildings like this. 
And God, tonight I pray that I might serve my part well, not uh, just unto you, God. You don't need me at all, but for these folks here. And it's not that they need me. It's just the amazing thing. You will use me and each one of us, God, in your kingdom. Um, And I just pray that I won't let you down nor them. And so, Lord, tonight I bow before you as your servant and before them as their servant. And I just seek that you would ordain and and, uh, ordain me and anoint me again, Lord, to be able to share thoughts that they may have had, questions that have come to mind, or, Lord, frustrations or otherwise, but, God, the truth could be shared. And not because I'm such a master of it, but because your truth, Lord, is the kind that outshines any of the truth of the world that we find is often hollow. I pray it, Lord, so that we can be free and free indeed, that we would no longer be held captive, that, God, that we could overcome those strongholds that in our own minds that have kept us from believing who we are in you. And Lord, I'm thankful too and pray tonight that as you want us to belong to you, that you will give us a desire that we are glad to belong to you. Uh, As glad tonight as we will be on that day, Jesus, when you return and in all of your glory or the night that we die, that we will be glad we belong to Christ and never look back the other way. So speak through me, speak to me, Lord. Let everybody hear as they need to hear. But God, most of all, may it be your voice and not mine. Might it be your thoughts and not mine. Might it be your heart compelling them, not mine, as we do this together to you and to your glory in the name of Jesus, the one that did die for us, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So if you've got your Bibles, let's go ahead and uh, start over here in the book of John. Because in the book of John, Jesus gives us some pictures of uh, belonging, some things that we could see here. And in doing so, it's not going to be the way you might think because it's not so much about belonging to him as it is belonging to someone else. Um, this belonging, I, you know, you hear phrases with people that look at somebody, and those two, they belong together. Or sometimes it's, in, and it's not such a positive thing as we think, those two deserve each other, you know, it's that type of thing. But, but, you know, we have these different things in our mind, and we see things that work together, and we kind of begin to believe. Uh, you follow any kind of sports, there's teams that somebody just doesn't seem to fit in with. They're not a team player. And other ones, it's like, wow, is that amazing how they work together? And a good scout, as well as a coach, will be able to do that and bring the strengths and weaknesses together to overcome. But here in the book of John, chapter 8, one of my favorite chapters because of what it starts with, and I know I don't have time for this, but I just love this story about the woman that's caught in adultery, not because it's so salacious and everything in that regard, but again, it just shows the heart of Jesus. It shows that quandary of him, and it gives us a real good basis, I believe, for understanding how we can be full of grace and truth. Uh, Jesus, with this woman caught in adultery, he didn't jump in and start throwing stones any more than he said, that, oh, that's okay, come on, guys, overlook a few things, that's no big deal. He didn't consider adultery to be any no big deal. And so it's here that he shows that balance in being able to not only rescue, but restore her. At the same time, he did a very clear teaching with these guys that were trying to catch him in the trap. He put them back into understanding the trap of their own lives, that the very thing that they were seeking to do was not the heart of God, but rather instead it was just to get at Jesus. And so it starts out that way, and then Jesus goes on into his own testimony about himself. And again, I don't have, I, I, I've got time, but I'm not going to take time from all, for all of this. But what I want to do is jump on up to chapter 8 here, and then let's go to 42, verse 42, if you will. So about two-thirds of the way back in this chapter. Got several verses to it. But in chapter 42, my subtitle says, and Jesus didn't put it here, John didn't put it here, uh, some man put it here in the Bible just to help kind of break things up, draw our attention to it. But the subtitle is what? That's what mine says, the children of the devil, whoa. Children of the corn, children of the devil, whoa, man. So what's this going to tell us about? Well, anybody here tonight come to find out how can I be a child of the devil? Anybody here tonight know they have been already? Yeah, that's what's important is we realize we have been. So so what's Jesus got to say about it? Jesus said to them in verse 42, if God were your father, you would love me. So there's one of those if-thens, and it's a conditional statement, and he's just saying if God is or were really, truly, absolutely, as you think that he is, if God was your father, you would love me. And they didn't. They despised him. He said, because you would love me, for I came from God. And that was just like, ah, they couldn't believe that he was saying that. And now I am here, and I've not come on my own, but it was he who sent me. He sent me here, you know. And he said, so why is my language not clear to you? And then look at this insight he gives. He says, because you are unable to hear what I say. 
Why can't you understand my language? Why is it unclear? He said, you're unable to hear it. And why are they unable to hear? He goes on, he said in verse 44, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. Wow. Man, would that be a slap upside your head if you thought you were not a Christian, but a great Jew, an ancestor of Abraham, those of the faithful, those that believed in the law, uh, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that you knew it forwards and backwards, and they actually knew it well enough to read their Bible backwards. Well, that's because they were Hebrews. But nonetheless, you know, they knew it all the way around. Some of you caught that. And uh, literally to this day, if you go buy a Bible and he over there in uh, Jerusalem, you will read it from, you start back here and go this way. It's really, really awkward. Even though it has English in it, it's still weird just because I'm just not used to reading that way. But Jesus isn't talking about which way we read the scriptures. He's talking to a group of people that believe they knew the scriptures, they belong to God. They wouldn't have said anything other than that, but yet they want to kill him, they hate him, they despise him. They have already tried to come up with ways to get rid of him. And Jesus is doing this unbelievable thing to them and telling them, and yet what I want you to do is be careful because it's so easy for me to jump on them with both feet because of how stupid and ignorant they can be. And man, they're just, you know, of the devil, just like this is saying here and everything. But Jesus isn't trying to condemn them here. He's not trying to crush them under his heel. He's trying to crush this hard shell nut around them to bring the, the true, the meat of the nut out that they can be delivered. He's trying to bring them into the awareness of the teaching, and that's what I want to do with you tonight. And it's not so much that I'm going to say that you belong to the devil, but I want to challenge you with this in mind. Who do you and what do you belong to? Because what he's saying here is the reason they didn't have room for Jesus or room for his word, couldn't even understand the very words that he was trying to convey and speak to them was because they belong to somebody else. Now, that might put a little bit of a fear into some of you. If you're new in Christ, I certainly don't want to scare the time out of you and scare you to pieces to the point giving up and saying, oh, well, then there's no use. But, you know, the Word of God, the Bible itself, and the Word of God and the teachings that come from it ought to be more desirable to us if we belong to Christ. And if we don't, it may seem very, very foreign to us and may, we may not even want it. And it amazes me because I've tried to read some of the philosophies of the world and did some study, not because I was questioning Christianity, and I don't mean that as a haughty thing either, but it wasn't that. It was just I wanted to try to figure out because I can't quite get my arms around. I have a lot of different uh, people that I've met and groups that I've studied that I, I respect and I look at, and I know it's the ones that some of you that know people that way, it's like, you mean to tell me they're not going to go to heaven just because they don't have or believe God the way we do? No, it's because the God that they believe in, they're skipping Jesus, and you can't get to God, the Father, the real God, without Jesus. But I respect them. And it's just like, you know, with, with especially some of the peaceful type uh, religions, you know, the Eastern religions that are about meditation and different things like that, that we could learn a lot from because we're not real good at meditating. And it's one of the reasons we stay at a high stress level. And it's one of the reasons we don't absorb all that Jesus says because we want to read it, get the facts, you know, I believe in Jesus, let's go on now. And then sometimes you need to let it sink in. It's like when you read the Psalms and it has that little word selah there, I go along with the guys that believe that that means pause and reflect upon this. And so sometimes we need to allow it. Now, I'm not here to teach you about these Eastern religions and different things, but they're intriguing to me because I see, but one of the things that I just can't get past myself is, how could you put faith in that? Well, if you listen and you start applying it, it works and you're a far, far more peaceful person and violence isn't the answer and all. No, but what's that gonna do to you when you die? Well, I'm trusting that the good spirits out there will recognize me as having a good spirit. And so they're going to, what? And somehow, some way, they come back around to point to heaven. But they aren't promised heaven because their prophet may have told them that. It's the same stuff as what, you know, the, the people were fighting in the Middle East. They believe in God. Same God we believe in. Came from Abraham. Just like the Jewish people we believe came from Abraham. Only this was Ishmael's. And the people that read what the prophet wrote there and have bought into it. The one thing you got to admit, man, when you strap on one of those vests, you're committed at least, aren't you? They believe and they belong and they're willing to because they believe their scriptures. Now, I, I bring this up because I want you to stop and consider what do I really believe? Not Steve, you. 
What do you really believe? And what do you know about God? And who do you belong to? Because who you belong to has everything to do with it. Those that believe in there will strap on their suicide vests. And, and I did see something that was funny to me. And you brought, well, I paused the camera here on this. Because it was like the two mothers that were talking. And they looked at each other and they said, man, our kids, oh, they, blow, they blow up so quickly. Um, not instead of grow up. I thought that was funny. Okay, that's, I'm warped, I realize, but it was kind of humorous to me. They blow up so quickly, you know? Uh, but to do that, they believe, they belong, right? They belong to a movement, but where does that movement take them? Now, we know that there are Christians that have put their life on the line too. But it wasn't because they just decided that day that, oh, I think I'll try being a Christian, and got them killed, it was because they were committed. The followers of Jesus Christ hung in there till the end. I mean, once they turned it around, it was different for them. They listened, but they belonged. And so this is vital that we understand who we belong to. We're no longer our own. We are bought with a price, but it's still our choice. Husbands and wives, they belong to each other by choice, mutual choice. I give my life to you, you give your life to me. We trade rings, we trade this, we trade that. But do you belong? As you grow into that real belonging, suddenly you begin to understand what Jesus was talking about and why this picture of marriage is exactly what he wants to have with the church, the bride of Christ, with every one of us as Christians, that he's like our husband, is because we belong. Not just because, well, I didn't have any better choices, or I didn't know what else to do, or because I just want to go to heaven, I don't want to go to hell. I mean, those are all reasons to get started. It's just like a lot of couples. I mean, if sex weren't involved, there'd be a lot of people not married. Right? I mean, be honest. Thank you, Joel. You and me, buddy, we're on the same page. So, so, you know, it's what gets us there, but it's not what keeps you together, is it? Okay, thank you, Joel. And, uh, but, you know, it, it's kind of one of these weird things, isn't it, when you think about it? Well, it's the same way with Jesus. We might start out because we don't want to go to hell, but that's not a good reason to really belong to him. When you belong to him, it's because you start and you see him differently, and when you do, you listen differently. As I've grown in my relationship with Julie, I listen differently. It's not just a, mm hmm, okay, uh huh, yeah. Because I found out that she would get things that I didn't know that I'd agreed to, you know, because I, was, mm -hmm, I wasn't paying any attention. But you pay attention differently when you belong. Too much emphasis on belonging? I don't believe I can emphasize enough about this because we don't really talk about it. But Jesus talked about it. And he said, man, he said, you claim to believe in God. I came from God, and yet you hate my guts. You want to kill me. I came from God. I didn't come on my own. He sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you're unable to hear what I say. Well, that makes sense. But it wasn't that Jesus was a poor communicator or was, you know, used big $12 words. No, man, he was very simple. You're unable to hear what, you, what I say because you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Man, that one, I don't know why, but that caught my eye. You belong to your father, the devil. So you can't hear Jesus very well. And this isn't a judgmental statement or a question, but... How well do you hear the Lord? Now, one of the ways that at least it can be helpful to us is if we, we pause and instead of trying to go, well, I don't know, sometimes it's hard. And I've told you, how do I know sometimes this voice or the voices that I hear? Is it God, is that you? Or is it just me thinking and wanting? Or is it the devil tempting me? How do I know the difference? And the difference isn't only in what is being, you know, presented or desired but it's also it's kind of what lies behind it and is this something that fits in with all of christianity and i wouldn't be afraid for the world to see or is this something i know i better get behind a cloak and hide things or behind the curtain or go into the darkness because it's not good you can tell real quickly if you analyze it but we're not good analyzers we have an idea have a thought and it's like hey sounds like a good idea to me and we jump in the very thing that all of you that have teenage kids are trying somehow to communicate to your kids. But do they ever look at you like they don't hear what you're saying? Why? It's not that they don't belong to you. You know, you had them. You know they do. You pay for them. 
It's that they don't belong to you. They were yours, but they haven't given you back. They haven't embraced you back. It's been years since they wanted you to pick them up, wanted you to, wanted to sit on your lap, wanted you to hold them. And that's why I think it's vital that we understand that our nature then is more inclined toward the devil and these desires that aren't just on the outside and aren't just verbal communication or, or thought processes, but rather instead what Jesus told us clearly was that what? Sin is within you. It's not what you eat and put into your body. No, man, it's what comes out of the mouth that reveals what's in you. Our desires are all wrapped up in us. And so one of the greatest things that we can ever begin to grasp in knowing that Jesus has saved us from our sins, though, is knowing that there still is inside of us, there still are these desires that we've known. Some of them we haven't all experienced, but we've known. But many of those experiences are still there, and they still have a taste and a flavor and a smell to them, and... We still have desires, right? They didn't just end just because we became a Christian. Now, what we've got to do, though, is be able to say, but, but I belong to this one. It's no different than the transition in your marriage where, no, I still can recognize there are other people out here that look good and that this and that might be desirable, but no, this is who I committed to. We remind ourselves we get back on track with truth again. I chose to make this decision. And that's what it is with Christianity because the devil will swirl in our minds. The world is out there advertising and showing us all that's available to us, awakening desires that we may, we may thought we put to rest. And if we're not careful and we don't remember who we belong to, we'll easily fall into that. And we'll look for verses that say, well, see, it says I can do this. Look, Paul said, Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach. Yeah, that's right. Not a whole jug, a little. Right? Right? But we look for those little loopholes there that we can find because why? We want to answer this desire. But I ask you again, who do you belong to? The word of God is going to have difficulty being comprehended, being desired at all, if you don't belong to Christ. But when you belong to him, even though just starting out reading it and don't even know where to begin, it may be difficult, you'll find that there are things that are in there and at least you want to hear speakers talk about and teachers teach about it so that you begin to go, oh, now I understand kind of how to put this together and what it's trying to say to me. Jesus is putting forth a very clear thing here. He said, man, the problem with you guys is you don't like me, you don't want me or anything else because you still belong to your father, the devil. And because of that, then you can't even hear... You can't see anything good that I do and you can't hear anything that's from the God that really loves you and wants to purchase your soul. The very God you claim to believe in, you can't even hear him because you're so embedded with the devil. Now, I'll tell you what that makes me want to do. It makes me want to say, Lord, God, please rescue me. Please, God, give me a hunger for your word. Please, God, if the devil still got a grip on me, I don't want to be saved with the devil still having a grip on me. I don't want to be saved and still be belonging to him. I want to make that complete transition. I want to know I belong to you, Jesus, not just that I wish to belong to you. You with me? And I've, I believe that it's vital that sometimes mentally we do that and we speak with our mouth out loud. We declare with our mouth who is Lord. We declare, I denounce you. I don't want anything to do with you anymore. Leave me alone in the name of Jesus. And that it's important that we do that and that we tell God, God, I do want to hear your voice. Just like when you are that teenager, when you are that prodigal that ran away and you suddenly realize, I ran away from the very thing that I need. I want to come back. And so I want to encourage us as we look at this because this scares the time out of me that because I belong to another if I don't sever the ties completely that that other one is able to turn my head and to keep my ears from hearing the one that loves me the most. And that's why I thought it was important last week that we looked at the idea that Jesus, that we, we were bought with a price, and yet it's still our choice to accept that he paid for our sins, and he bought us. But once you buy into the fact he bought you and he paid for you, then it is like what we read, you're no longer your own anymore. You belong to the one who died to save you. And as you belong to him, then this ought to all change. But these guys, you belong to your father, the devil. You want to carry out his desire. I presume if that's the case then, and I belong to Jesus, I will want to carry out my father's desire. What do you think? 
I will want to hear his voice and I won't put up the hand and, and ignore his voice. I won't put my fingers in my ear and go, la, 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 I don't hear what you're saying. I instead want to hear from God because I know he's always got my best at heart and if he's asking me to help somebody else, it's because a part of his best is what somebody else is needing at that moment as well. Down, down through here then we read on that uh, there's another verse here that he gets into. But let's read that just one more time with verse 44. You belong to your father, the devil. And notice those that do. And this is why we have trouble with some people understanding them or being able to relate to them. And I'm not saying that in a judgmental, condemning factor. I'm just saying we ought to have uh, empathy and sympathy for them and prayers that God would help release them and use others around them. You belong to your father, the devil. You want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. That's what many believe is why Satan was kicked out of heaven, is he wouldn't hold on to the truth. He wanted to do what he wanted to do the way he wanted to do it. Not holding the truth, for there's no truth in him when he speaks his native language. He's a liar and the father of lies. Boy, that's another thing, then, if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the it's about as opposite as you can get, isn't it? The father of all lies, even the what? The white lies that matter. Even the white lies. The ones that we've gotten so used to and justifying and we don't even get a guilty conscience over. We ought to be about the truth. Man, it's difficult. But Jesus is the truth. And so I don't want, I want to get and separate myself as far as possible away from that. What about you? And then we read in verse 45, yet because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me because you're so used to the lies and you've made up your own lies about who you are and what's right. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin if I'm telling the, if I'm telling the truth? Why don't you believe me? And then he gives one more insight to this belonging thing. He who belongs to God, hears what God says. Wow. If we belong to God, not just believe in God. That, that's, and, and don't get me wrong, you can't belong without believing, but, but this is above and beyond believing. And yet, it's synonymous. Because if I don't believe in Julie, I won't belong to Julie. But if I don't belong to Julie, I won't really believe in her. So, I mean, it works. But, but I want us to see this because I think Jesus is trying to bring something out here. He, I'm trying. I forget that he is bringing something out. He who belongs to God hears what God says. And he tells them again, the reason that you don't hear is you don't belong to God. Now that's something that's weighty, isn't it? And so again, I think it's important to say, God, I want to hear from you. I don't want to belong to him. I want to belong to you and I want to hear you. And I want to learn your voice and what it sounds like. I want to read what you've said, but I want to know when you're guiding me personally. But let me tell you what it sounds like. It's this. It's like when we go to do something selfish and he goes, hey, you really want to do that? Now, on the other hand, we go to do something godly and unselfish. The devil's the one, you really want to do that for them? Right? Sounds a lot alike. What's different? One is self-serving. The other is other serving. The voice of God in the way for me, it's not even so much uh, anymore that you need to go and do this. No, it's more this. Mr. Ed, without talking, nudging you, you know, going, you know, you know. And, you know, that used to kind of bug me. And it's like, why don't you just talk clearly? And it's like, don't talk out loud, please, because I'd rather you just nudge me. Don't make me fall down, but just nudge me, you know. I heard about the little girl that was on her way to church one day, and she had her little dress on, everything was right, and her little white socks turned down, and her patent leather shoes, and she's skipping along, and she's saying... God, you got to help me get there. I don't want to be late. And she does, as she's doing it, she trips on one of those pieces of sidewalk that messed up. And she goes, well, you don't have to push me. She was walking with God so much that she thought it was his fault. But, but man, back to this, belong to God and here's what God says. Wow. And so I think that it's healthy for us to say to God at times, Lord, I'm not hearing much from you. Is it because everything's really, really cool? Or do I need to reinforce my belonging? Can I come sit on your lap for a while? Will you hold me? 
I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I honestly don't believe that God says, I don't have time for you. My lap's not big enough for you. And one of the greatest things that we can do sometimes so that we hear God is, I believe, to slow down and just get up into his lap and say, let me hear your voice again so I don't miss it. So there's that passage. Now, from there, I want to, if you will, stay here in the book of John with me. Well, the, there is another one here in 8 that I did. I saw where I made a note to it. And I think it's just because it's interesting, okay, if you will. Um, verse 54. If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one that glorifies me. Though you don't know him, I know him. If I said I didn't, I'd be a liar like you, but I do know him, and I keep his what? Word. I keep his word. What's it mean? I keep his Bible in my car. I keep his word uh, when I feel like it, or I know I hold on to it. He's saying, man, no, I know what God has said, and when I'm faced with a dilemma, I'm going to go with God and what he's said already, what he's established. That's why I think it's vital in that as we learn about walking with the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will never tell you something that disagrees with this book. It won't conflict with it. Uh, because the Holy Spirit is going to say things that the Word backs up, and the Spirit will back the Word up, the Word backs the Spirit up, and it's that way we can know. That's why I think it's interesting as you listen to preachers and teachers is to make sure that when you hear them say something, uh, recently uh, was real being passed around a lot, and, and I don't want to misrepresent this because I, I like the time and love the time out of Steve Harvey. I think he's a cool guy, uh, and I thought that he handled the deal with the Miss Universe probably as eloquently as I could have ever thought about doing. You know, you just, it, it happened, I did it, I screwed up, I messed up, I'm sorry. What else can you do about it, you know? But have any of you seen his little thing that he tapes between shows sometimes or whatever the deal about jump? Okay. It was, it was good. I mean, the thought, the, the motivation behind it, everything. But man, there were scriptures that were misrepresented there. And there was a part inside of me that I was like, ugh. And in saying that, I'm not speaking against him because somebody probably told him. The other thing is, there are times that I've, said something and said it was in Romans where it wasn't Romans, it was another passage. So it could have been even as simple as that. But, but in saying that, I'm not trying to say, so let's become sleuths that go out and check up and see. But I do want you to be like the Bereans. And we put these scriptures up here, not because you have to turn to each one of them, but so you can write them down and go back later to see if what I said was really in the Bible. And so you can read for yourself and make up your own mind. This is what the Bible says. And so that's the concept of giving you this. It's not You've got to, if you're a good Christian, you'll read all these passages while I keep talking and talking and talking. That's kind of hard to keep up with. But instead, it's about that so that you can go back and check because in the book of Acts, it says that the Bereans were of noble character because after listening to Paul, they went home and they searched what? The scriptures to see if what he said fit with them. Now, I think this is crucial within this. And that's what Jesus says. You know, I keep your word, God, I keep your word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. And then they make all this up of him. But I just wanted to point that out, that a part of belonging to God, like Jesus belonged to God, was he keeps his word. And that's where we go over here to John chapter 14 and 15. In John 14, now these verses aren't going to say anything about belonging. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't say they don't have any of the context of it. It's not that. I just wanted to point out to you, because we're on the way to 15, that while we're here in John 14, I want you to see this and how many times Jesus emphasized and put together this hearing God, but not only hearing him, but what? Also believing, which meant you would obey. Um, the old hymn, um, start out, or the chorus was a word that begins with a T, trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in jesus but to trust and obey I, I in our day and age of rebellion i think it's vital that we curb our human and our american ways and that we make sure that we do not only hear but we hear we believe and we obey um I've done 500 or so weddings, and in that I get people oftentimes that say, you don't make us say obey, do you? 
I said, I'm not going to make you say that, but you will someday. Um, you don't have to put it in your vows. It'll just happen, you know. But the obey part, we kind of find ourselves, wait a minute, no, no, nobody's going to tell me what to do. But, but I want you to see what Jesus had to say here. John 14, okay? Verse 15, first of all, all right? John 14 and verse 15. If you love me, you obey what I command. Wow, now he doesn't just talk about belonging. He's talking about not just hearing. He's talking about what? Loving. If you love me, you will what? Obey. Obey. I mean, is that a difficult to comprehend to understand? Nope, it's pretty clear cut. Pretty much what my dad tried to tell me. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And then he said, I'll ask the Father to send another counselor to you to be with you forever. Not only in 15, but just in case we thought, well, that was just a random thought that came out of Jesus' mouth. I facetiously, all right? But we jump on down here to 20. On that day, you'll realize that I am the Father. You are in me, and I am in you. I like that verse. I think I, I have to remind myself of that. And this picture gets taken further than that because, remember, at the beginning of it is that a lot of funerals, and I've used it at a lot of funerals. Don't let your heart be troubled, but trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many, that's the King James Version, that's wrong. In my Father's house are many rooms, and I don't mean that bad. You're right, it does say mansions. I just think it's so totally unfair because the word really is abode. And I just think it's cheap when we expect God to go prepare a mansion for us and we're talking about this temple, like we talked about last week, that's our heart that he bought with a price, and your body is the temple of God. And we don't often look at this as being a mansion, or did, do you? Have you been building this great big mansion inside your heart and chest saying, God, man, nothing's too good for you. I'm going to give you everything I can. That's what it should be, but we don't. So what this word really does say is I'm going there to prepare a place for you or a, an abode likely translation, and it's also found down here later on where Jesus talks about we'll come and make our abode with you. So, so it works both ways, but the biggest thing I was trying to get here and on that, verse 20 says, you'll realize I am the Father, you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them or obeys them, he is the one who loves me. How... And I might be preaching to the choir tonight. I mean, anybody else here struggle a little bit with that obey thing? How can we forget? How do we miss? How do we, you know, and we don't get up in the morning, hey, I'm going to obey you three things, but not five. And we don't do that. Of course we obey. But, but the bigger thing is, what he's saying is, this is your litmus test. You can tell a lot about how much you love me by how much do you obey me. And man, I think any of you that have had kids would have to say that that, that kind of goes hand in hand, right? If they love you, they will what? Obey. And yet we don't give God that same dignity. And just in case you think again that Jesus has just maybe slipped up a couple times, read verse 23 with me. This is after he talked to Judas, or Judas spoke to him. He said, if anyone loves me, verse 23, anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him and we will come to him and make, here's that word again, our home, our abode, or our mansion, if you want to use that with him. But that is the exact same word as was back up here in the first two or three verses. Exactly the same Greek word. That's why I'm saying it's not fair to put mansion up here if you're not going to put it down here. And why, what I'm saying by that is, if I'm expecting Jesus to prepare something for me, then I'm going to at least do my best to prepare something for him. And it's not just going to be a place. I want it to be a mansion for him, right? But that's what the Father promises. If you, if you love me, you'll obey my teaching, and my Father will love you for loving me. We will come to you. We'll make our home with you, with anyone that will love me and obey me. He who does not love me, verse 24 says, what? Will not obey my teaching. Now, backing up. So we got love and obey, but back over here, remember Jesus told these guys, he said, you can't, you don't belong to me, so you can't even understand what I'm saying. And I think that's bad, but I think it's worse to say, I belong to you, I don't care what you're saying. Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do. Right? 
And that's what we claim. I'm a Christian. I belong. Then it's simple. Build up the love. So once again, what do we do? We open up our mouth and we say, Lord, I must have offended you a million times. I don't focus on being obedient. I expect you'll do everything you said you would do, but obviously I don't love you as much as I need to. Will you help me? I want to purpose in my heart to love you more and to obey you more and to know you more, to belong to you. Will you help me? Will you help me to realize when I'm disobeying you so that I can stop and repent soon instead of being oblivious to it? You see how important it is to have this walking, talking, breathing relationship with Christ? So that as we recognize things, and if we don't recognize, he helps us, and as we do, we come to him so that we get away from this where our natural inclination is to hear every desire over here that the devil stirs in us and follow through with it because we kind of know what the outcome is going to be minus how we're going to feel guilty with God. So let's just start building this relationship with Christ to the point that we admit, Lord, I just don't love you enough, but I want to. I want to love you more. I want to wait till I get to my deathbed to, to profess my dying love for you when I know it's safe and I can keep it. I want to love you before I ever get on that deathbed. And the way we do that is by dying to ourself. Now, as you jump over with me to 15, I want, want to say one more thing, and it's because this, and, and you know I've said this a couple of hundred times without exaggerating. In Matthew, I believe it's seven, Jesus talks about the wise and the foolish. The wise man built his house upon a thought it was a trick question that's right on a rock and jesus just happens to be the rock the foolish man builds his house upon the sand the moral of the story is a storm comes on both of them which one stands the one that's not on the sand the stands but the one that's on the or it fails excuse me but the one that's on this the uh, rock it lasts it's able to endure and jesus sums all that up by saying that what what's the wise man do he hears my word and he obeys it. That's the difference between the wise and the foolish. The foolish man that built on the sand heard his word the same as this guy over here. It's forgotten in that. Do you see how the devil has dulled our senses down to we know the story, we know it's the one on the rock, so we ought to lay our foundation on the rock, don't build on the sand, and none of us, you know, we all want a beach house, but we're not going to build on the sand. And that's not what Jesus is really talking about. He's talking about it's obedience. The heart of obedience is, in fact, wisdom, is, in fact, what lets you last and stay and remain and endure the storms. So I want you to consider in your life that, man, as these storms come about, and whether it was, you don't have to hold your hand up, but some of you, weren't some of you afraid you heard the thunder and the lightning? Fear came and gripped you. Was my wife afraid? Because I'm driving in it. She tells me to slow down. I said, I'm not going to slow down. She had the fear of God in her. But, you know, what do we do in the midst of the storms? Well, just whether or not you've heard and obeyed, because if you believe, you're obeying God. And you don't have to fret about the storms. Because you've got all of his word to relax upon and to take assurance in. But if you're building on your own fun sand life on the beach and the storms come, you got something to worry about. But those that are embedded in the Word of God and the Word of God is in them, and I don't just mean that they can quote the Scriptures forward and backwards. I'm talking about the ones that have read and take it to heart and apply it to their life and confess when they mess up. Man, I'm telling you what, fear begins to subside greatly. Because your confidence in Christ is built because there's nothing between you other than love and respect and obedience by desire. Not because you have to, not because you're knuckling under. Chapter 15 then. Jump on over to verse 19. I mean, I'd really like to preach on this whole chapter, but we don't have time for that. So actually, verse 18 kind of leads into it. The world, what? Hates the disciples. Oh, front page news, man. You know, it's not actually front page, but it's over here on one of the side pages. World hates the, the disciples. Oh, moral of the story, don't be a disciple then. The world will love you. 
That's what Jesus basically said. If the world hates you, keep it first. If you belonged to the world, and that's past tense there, or current tense would be if you belong to the world, it will love you as its own. As it is, you don't belong to the world. He's speaking to those disciples because I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Did you know that the litmus test here then for finding out about where you're at with the world is how much does the world love you? And what he clearly says here is if you love me and you're attached to me, the world is going to what? Hate you. Going back in another passage where the word hate is used, Jesus says you can't masters because you'll either love one and hate the other or what? You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. So the world will despise those that truly belong to Christ. People of the world will despise those that truly belong to Christ. They'll never do whatever they can, but a part of it should be because our light is shining enough that it lets their darkness kind of come out. And I'm not saying that because we try to do that and judge them. No, it's just Jesus will do that to people. But I think that's real vital as you're building then your understanding of belonging to Christ, then don't be surprised if the world doesn't love you the same way it does. Your friends that you had before Christ will suddenly find you very peculiar. They will look at you. Well, what happened to you? You used to be so much fun. And they will lead you to believe, and it sounds like a voice that's compelling, and say, why don't you come and do what we used to do? And what you need to do at that point in time is be able to go, I five Jesus on the side. We'll talk about this later. But no, I'm content with where I'm at. I don't want to go back to that other life. But if you become a Christian and the world still embraces you the same as it did, I would question my Christianity. I'm not saying I'm going to question your Christianity. I'm just saying you should question your own because it does make a difference in the world. Jesus said, if you belong to me, the world will hate you. And if the world embraces you, folks, it's saying that they're not completely convinced that you completely belong to Christ. And only you and I can do anything about it. And it's not telling them how I'm such a Christian now. It's not doing that. It's just showing them and it's consistently living in a way that they go, you're not the same as you were. And that's when then, when you're consistent with that, that there will be people over here in the world who will begin to look at what they're doing and say, you have peace, I don't have peace. You seem to be content, I'm not content. You have no regrets on Monday mornings, I have regrets. What's different about us? I want what you've got. That's the way it's supposed to work. And so do you see this whole picture of belonging to Christ is so much more than saying, I believe, I believe. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. That's what some people tell you. That's all you got to do. No, there's more to it than that. It's not just saying that and repeating after the preacher. In fact, if you've noticed, I don't have people repeat after me. You know why? Because I'm not going to be your puppet master. Master, if you believe in him, you ought to say it in your own mouth. Because this isn't the only place you're ever supposed to say it. You're supposed to tell the rest of the world too. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. He is my Lord and my Savior because I surrender all to him. He, I belong to him because he bought me with the price and I'm not turning my back on him now. I can't say that for you. I can only say it about him for me. Now, within this then, I want to encourage you to start looking at your life and just asking God, God, would you show me, as, as, have, have the lines gotten more bold in my life? Do people really know I'm yours? Lord, if, if I'm getting closer to you, I want to be careful here. I ask this, God, but will you go ahead and just give me a smile by letting the world hate me a little more? Oh, I'm not praying that. Why? That's probably when you're playing Christianity chameleon style, and it's, you just want to kind of blend in according to what color it is. I'm telling you, man, if you're sold out, sell out. But if you're not sold on Jesus Christ, don't fool yourself into pretending that you are. Because what the Lord's done is plenty of ways that we can know we belong to him. Not just litmus test, but true test to test the strength and integrity of our steel. To be able to know that we have a metal about us that's strong 
and that we are walking with him because we're leaving behind the things of the past, not just people, but those desires that once were there that held us because there's a new desire that's greater within us. And it's all because, not just that we belong to him, but it's because he reached out to us and said, if you want it, I've got it, come on. And you belong to me, I'll belong with you. And I'll protect you, I'll look after you. I won't make the world love you, I'll hate you. I won't keep you from dying because they may be the ones that kill you, but I'll tell you this, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You'll never be just on your own if you're with me. I think that is about as fantastic a thing as you can get, and Gandhi can't give me that. I can only go in with myself and find the peace and the serenity. Man, this says, I've got the Prince of Peace. Got the Prince of Peace. That man will not leave. And why would I not want to belong to that? You won't believe I had some other passages, right? The longer it goes, the more you believe it. All right. So another day, another dollar, another passage. God willing, man. Can I do one more? Okay, let's do one more. Joel, just for you, okay? Let's go on over to the book of Romans here. Romans chapter 1. That's a dangerous one. Boy, you start into Romans, it's like, oh, wow. Okay, Romans chapter 1. This is one that we can take a look at. And... Uh, it's, it's important that we, we see it because this is the greatest thing. And it's a great way to leave tonight too, is uh, knowing this. Paul begins this book of Romans. And just remember, it's a letter. It wasn't started out as a book. It's written to people that are in the Rome, the center of the world, the, where the Caesar is the Lord. Uh, it is a cesspool of every immorality, America on steroids, I mean, it's not that we're good. It's just that we pale in comparison to the immorality that was going on in Rome. Um, let alone politically, it was far worse than it is here. I mean, because there were people actually assassinating one another there. And so just, just so you get this picture. And my heart and soul feel, even though this doesn't say, I think that the Apostle Paul was just crazy enough in the head that after he believed that Jesus would save him even though he'd killed Christians and that he was to take the gospel to the Gentiles, I believe Jesus was cra or Paul was just crazy enough in the head to say, I so believe in this thing called grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to take it to the good people. I'm taking it to the vile. That's what I think. I want to tell you there's still some preachers, there's still some missionaries to this day that that's what they want to go to. They don't want to go to the easy places. They want to go to the difficult. I want to tell you in my heart when I came to Atlanta, I felt called. I mean, I did feel called, and I knew that it wasn't going to be what I was used to because, Dorothy, we're not in Kansas anymore, right, Julie? It was like it was different all right, because all of no, man, but I mean, as a whole, there just is a far less community, far less openness, and just that salt to the earth type thing. And I'm not saying nobody here, I'm just saying as a whole, but I don't even think it compares at all to what Paul went. So he goes into Rome, and he walks into this, and he's telling the story about Jesus Christ. Now he's writing to those that out of the midst of that, they did become believers. And so he starts this letter by saying, and it's kind of like us, our emails will always say who it's from, right? Or you don't click on it. And that's the way they used to write letters. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be a what? An apostle. Set apart for the gospel. That's holiness. That's, a, that's ordination, being ordained. Set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures, talking about the Old Testament, uh, regarding his son, uh, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, but who through the spirit of holiness was declared with the power to be the son of God resurrection from the dead jesus christ our lord so that's what paul puts into place here and he's saying man this is what i stand on shoulder width apart man i'm ready to go into the world with what i've got i believe in jesus okay i belong to jesus um and verse five he says through him and for his name's sake we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among the gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith we, we were given this calling of God to call people to an obedience. And the obedience comes from what? Faith. 
Much like Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey what I say. And that's what he's saying here, only it's in it, you'll obey what I say. But now, here's the cool part. And you also, and we get this because Jesus told his disciples that when they went into the world to be making other disciples and teaching them to observe all that he had told them. So when we read the book of Romans, it's not like taking an Old Testament passage that was given to the Jewish people or, person, or people at a certain time or a certain prophet. This is us taking the New Testament that was given to all the church, all the Christians. So he said, now verse six, notice this, and this is what I want you to get, go home with tonight. You also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. You say, all that for that? I'm saying everything. You're called to belong to Jesus Christ. And what I want to close with, have you answered the phone? He's on the other end. Hey, I died for you. Uh, I'm leaving you a voicemail because you never want to uh, I want you to belong to me I can't make you do that but I died so you can do you want some of this answer the phone we're called to belong to Jesus let's pray dear God let